Prepare to be pickled, Mr. Bond. If you're as lucky as I am to have a home garden where you can grow your own vegetables, or maybe you've been just to the farmer's market and you spent like 40 bucks on cucumbers and now you're drowning in vegetables and you're wondering how you're gonna use all of these up before they go bad, I'm here to help. Today, I'm gonna to show you uh, a few very basic, very easy preservation methods that anybody can do at home uh, so that those vegetables last as long as possible and you can eat them for months to come. Back in ye old days, uh, preservation was a way of life uh, in, in places like Canada where it's super cold. Uh, if you didn't preserve stuff, you would die in the winter because there's no food growing. So people have invented ways for millennia to preserve food. Um, today we're gonna go over a couple of my personal favorites. Uh, very modern style, comparatively, pickling. Uh, a very ancient style, lacto-fermenting. And then talk about some other stuff, uh, some other ways that I like to preserve food that you can do at home. I love preservation um, because I get to eat really delicious fresh stuff throughout the winter uh, when it's dark and depressing. I just need like a little sunshine in my life. So eating food that I canned in the summer is a really great way to do that and get a little bit of that life, light back in your life as you're waiting for the weather to warm up. So we've got kind of a crazy vegetable harvest here. We, we had lots of luck this year with turnips, with tomatoes, with onions, beans, fennel, a uh, number of other things. I'm gonna use several of these things today in, in, in my preserves. So let's start with pickles. All right, first up is pickling. You're probably familiar with pickles. I'm sure you've had them before. Maybe you love them, maybe you hate them. If you, you're watching this video, you probably like them. Pickling is, you know, it's preserving things in an acidic liquid, a, you know, generally a vinegar and salt brine. There are different ways to do it, but basically you've got three main components. You've got the thing that's being pickled, you know, vegetables, maybe cucumbers, they can be, um, beans, I'm gonna do some turnips and some beans today, um, but you can pickle a lot of things. Uh, you have the solution that you're pickling in, so generally a mixture of vinegar and water and salt and sugar if you're kinda of crazy. Uh, and there's what I like to call the mix-ins, which are things like peppercorns and bay leaves and mustard seed, garlic, chili flakes, stuff that adds additional flavor to your pickles. Don't be afraid to get creative, try something weird. Uh, it, it might not turn out, but it's fun to experiment. You know, you can you can get crazy with the mix-ins that you use. You can use juniper berries, or you can do like curried powder and make curried pickles. Those are delicious. Um, you can pickle things like, like fruits. You know, you can pickle peaches and plums and see if they're good. They might be delicious, who knows? Uh, so have fun and, and get wild with it. Uh, today, we're going to start with just some very basic stuff. We're gonna do some pickled beans, uh, just for snacking on and having with Caesars. And we're gonna do a pickled turnip, which is a, a Middle Eastern um, pickle. I know it from Syrian cuisine, so I like to have it with uh, shawarma and that kind of thing. Um, but I, I think they make them in a lot of places. Now, pickling is all about mise en place. So first, you wanna take your canning jars, you wanna wash them well with soap and water, you wanna sterilize them in boiling water covered by at least an inch, and you wanna boil them for 10 minutes plus one minute for every 1,000 feet above sea level. You wanna give your vegetables a wash. You wanna make sure that they are nice and clean and, and free of dirt and that kind of thing. You obviously wanna trim off any parts that you don't wanna eat. So, you know, the tops of these yellow beans, we're just gonna trim those guys here. Anything that's a bit woody, but we're also gonna cut away anything that's not good, that's, that looks a little rotten. If something's truly questionable, I wouldn't suggest canning it. Um, preservation, you want vegetables and fruits that are generally in pretty pristine condition um, because they're gonna be sitting around for possibly several months and uh, and you don't want something nasty sitting around for several months. It, it's also the kind of thing where like, you know, quality in equals quality out, garbage in equals garbage out. So if you start with good quality produce, you're gonna end with a good quality pickle. With a vegetable like these turnips, obviously you wanna trim off the ends. If the skin is tough, and you don't wanna eat it, or if it's got some blemishes on it, then you might wanna go in with a vegetable peeler and just take that off. Something like a beet, you're gonna to wanna to peel because the skin really isn't great to eat, um, but stuff with thinner skins that's reasonably edible, you can get away with keeping that. Removing the skin also helps to remove any bacteria that might be lingering. Um, chances are the vinegar brine's gonna kill any bacteria hanging out on your vegetables, but it doesn't hurt to just go the extra step to skin things. So there's no chances of any, any wild stuff in there getting into your pickles. While we're trimming up our vegetables, we wanna get our brine going uh, because this requires some time to heat up and for the salt and potentially sugar to dissolve. So my basic brine recipe that I like to do is eight parts water, eight parts vinegar, and one part salt. 
Uh, it's not super precise. I'm doing things by volume. Technically, you should be working by weight. Um, but with pickling, as long as you're kind of in that range, I found it works out really well. A good formula to know how much brine to make is for every liter jar that you're canning, you want to do about half a liter of brine. So I've got two one liter jars. I'm hoping everything's going to fit in these. So I'm going to start by making one liter of brine. You can always make more later. So I have about half a liter tap water there. We're gonna measure out half a liter of distilled white vinegar. You can use other vinegars. Apple cider vinegar can be nice, rice vinegar, but because we're using a lot of it, white vinegar is cheap and does the trick really nicely. It can be a little harsh, that's why we're adding some water and we're gonna add lots of other flavorings in there as well. So because we did about half a liter or two cups of vinegar, we're gonna do about a quarter cup that's one part to eight parts, so about a quarter cup of salt. And we're just gonna get that going over a medium heat. Woo! <laughs> what? Uh, I still got my beard, that's good. Woo! We're gonna get that going over a medium heat. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, do that. I managed not to get myself on the mandolin, which is good because these guys are sharp. I hurt myself today on a mandolin. So our brine's hot, our mise en place is ready to go. So let's get these pickles into a jar. The first step I like to do is just add in the, the mix-ins, as I call them. So anything that's gonna flavor your pickles. For the Middle Eastern turnip pickles, we're gonna go uh, just with some garlic, real simple. And then we're gonna go a little more traditional Western with, with the beans. So we're gonna do a bunch of peppercorn, we're gonna do some yellow mustard seed, um, bay leaves are good, I'm out of those, but bay leaves are good. If you have just like a generic pickling spice mix, um, that works really well too. There's a few other things in there, um, but this is what I have in my pantry. I'm gonna throw some crushed red chilies in there too, some dried red chilies, because I wanna give, I wanna give these some heat. I want them to be spicy. Cool. And for a little dill flavor, I've got just a little bit of dill, not, I don't want a lot. Uh, and I've got some dill flowers that are blossoming right now. They're real pretty, but they also have a nice flavor too. So I'm just gonna pack those in there. And then we just pack in our ingredients. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We, we wanna keep them away from the, top, the very top of the jar. We wanna make sure that we can easily submerge them in brine. So I like to kind of knock things off to one side and then just like jam in as much as I can to finish filling the jar. If you, if you like, you don't need to go nuts cramming it either. You can just like can a second jar of stuff. Uh, for the turnips, we're just gonna go right in here. So we've got mostly turnip, but we got some beet mixed in there. That's pretty traditional. A handy piece of gear that's, that's good to have and very cheap is just a canning funnel. Especially if you get into like actually canning and you're doing uh, any sauce or any you know jam, anything that's kind of messy. You wanna have one of these just to keep everything off the lip of your jar. Normally the, the Syrian pickled turnips are bigger than this, more like a baton than a julienne, but uh, I want to test out these fancy new mandolins we have. So I decided to go small and I think it'll be really good if I am doing shawarma because then you'll kind of get some in each bite. And there we have it. So now we're just gonna pour in our brine. Okay, and our jars are full, so this is great. Um, if, if we just wanna throw these in the fridge and we're not doing a lot of pickles, all you gotta do is throw a lid on that sucker, let them cool off, uh, and bang them in the fridge. And you can eat them in a week or two, or, or let them go kind of as long as you want. They'll keep for a really long time. If you wanna can these, if you're making a lot and you have like 
10 jars, you probably don't want all that in your fridge. Um, so you're gonna wanna water can them. Now water canning is a lot of fun and it's not complicated or hard, but it is important that you uh, do it properly so that you don't kill anybody. Uh, Cause you know, that's not a good time. So I would go watch a different video on canning. But if you're interested and you're wondering how much work it is, it's not that bad. So you, you need cans you, or you need jars. Uh, generally you want jars that are in good shape. You're not reusing like old mustard or pickle jars. You want jars that are built for canning that can handle that kind of uh, temperature. Um, you want lids that are brand new. You need a brand new seal each time, but the jar and the ring can be reused. You wanna wipe the rim with vinegar, make sure it's really clean, and you wanna make sure that you're fill, full within either half an inch or an inch of the top of the jar, depending on what it is you're canning. Uh, you wanna make sure your brine does come all the way up here and covers everything in the jar sufficiently. So you close that up. While you're getting all your vegetables and your brine ready, you wanna get your biggest stock pot, put it on the stove, get it to a rolling boil, sanitize your jars in there, and then do your pickling. Once all your jars are ready to go, you're just gonna tighten them down just so they're like barely finger tight. Uh, you're gonna can them for an amount of time, depending on what you're canning, how big the jar is and your elevation. And so look that up again, watch like a video or get a book on canning. Um, but basically you just submerge them in boiling water for a set amount of time. Uh, then you pull them out, you let them cool, you tighten them so they seal properly, uh, let them sit overnight. And then important, you remove the rings so that the jars don't rust, and if you have an improper seal, you can tell. So once they're fully cool, you actually lift them just by the lid to test that seal and make sure it's it's airtight. Um, and then you can uh, you can chuck them in your cupboard and let them sit for a year or two. Um, if they're improperly sealed, just chuck them in the fridge and, and eat them right away. It's not a big deal. Um, but you do not want to leave something sitting on the cabinet that's that's improperly sealed. You also want to make sure you label what it is and when you made it so that you can eat them in the order that they've been made. Go watch a video on canning. It's really fun and cool, but you don't want to fuck it up. Method number two is lacto-fermentation. So it resembles pickling, and it's, I, I believe it's the grandfather to pickling, uh, but it's a lot different uh, functionally. So basically what we're doing here is we are doing a similar setup. We've got something that we're going to preserve, we've got a brine, and then we've got our flavorings. The big difference here is that the brine is just salt water and we are not canning this, and we're not even gonna put it in the fridge at this point. We're gonna take fresh vegetables. Um, we're not gonna wash them all that much because we wanna use the lactic acid bacteria that exist on the surface, on the skins of the vegetables. What those bacteria do is they eat sugar and they convert it into lactic acid. That makes the pickles tangy and sour. Uh, and so you get something that's very different, a lot more funky, a lot more nuanced uh, than a vinegar pickle. Some people say it's healthy for your gut bacteria. I'm no doctor, but they taste delicious. So let's make some. So lactic fermentation basically just requires salt. The bacteria doesn't require salt to work, but as little as 2% salt by weight of the total mass uh, will be enough to stop unwanted bacteria in its tracks, including botulism, which is kind of important. So we're gonna use a minimum of 2% salt. Uh, you can go all the way up to about 8% uh, salt. The saltier you get, obviously the saltier it'll taste. And, and, and generally a saltier ferment, the vegetables will stay firmer, more like what you think of as a pickle. The lower you go in salt, uh, the softer they're gonna be, the more they're gonna break down. So the water content and the firmness of the thing that you're fermenting might dictate uh, how much salt you want. You can go lower with firm things like carrots and fennel and beans, um, but if you're fermenting uh, maybe a cucumber pickle and you want it to last longer and, and not get mushy, you're gonna wanna go for about 5% salt so it stays nice and firm. People who are real hippies about this or do it primarily for the health reasons, uh, typically go for a lower salt concentration around 2%. I like kind of like three to 5%. Uh, personally, I just like a little more firmness, a little more pickliness. You can ferment um, almost anything, pretty much any fruit and vegetable, but some are gonna turn out better than others. Um, you know, you can, you can lacto-ferment fruits like plums and, and cherries and probably grapes, um, but I typically stick to things more like vegetables because I like using them more as a condiment. Um, kimchi, uh, sauerkraut, things like that, those are traditionally lacto-ferments, and so that's the kind of stuff I make at home. 
This kind of preservation is also pretty low on the gear list. I like these latch top jars. Um, the salt water can rust more traditional jar lids. Um, so these guys use a rubber seal and they open really easily so you can burp them and let the CO2 out. We'll show that later. You get these guys at Ikea for a few bucks and they have about a 1.6 liter capacity. So lots of space for making larger batches of stuff. You also want a good kitchen scale. Um, generally a larger guy is better that goes up to about five kilos. Mine's dead at the moment. So we're just gonna use this little scale here. Uh, fermentation weights are optional, um, but they can be a good way to kind of keep everything submerged under the brine. You do want to keep the environment fairly oxygen free because that will um, inhibit the growth of mold, which is another thing you want to avoid. Same as pickling, we want to wash and sanitize our jars really well, but we don't need to wash the vegetables thoroughly. I did give these carrots a really good wash because they were covered in dirt, um, but things that grow above the ground, you don't need to worry about. Today, we're gonna make a jardinera, which is, a, I think, an Italian-American condiment. Basically, it's a whole bunch of vegetables that are either pickled or fermented together, and then you chop them up and you throw them on sandwiches like muffaletta. It's really delicious. You can use a lot of different vegetables. I find firm vegetables tend to hold up better. Um, so today, I'm going to use beans from the vine, uh, some onions, some fresh carrots, and some fennel. I find celery and bell pepper both go really well in jardinera. Uh, cauliflower is really good. I was gonna use this guy, um, but this is a good example of what you shouldn't do when you're preserving. This guy has sat for a little while. He wasn't looking so hot in the garden, and then he sat in my fridge for a few days, and he's starting to look a little, a little moldy maybe. I could go in and trim it up, uh, but you're better off safe than sorry, so I'm honestly just gonna compost this because I don't wanna introduce potentially mold bacteria, mold or bacteria uh, to my ferment. Better safe than sorry. Let's get these all diced up into a fairly consistent size and then we'll start a ferment. So we've got all of our stuff prepped now, all diced about the same size, doesn't matter that much for a ferment. Uh, we are gonna take our vessel, we're gonna zero it out on our scale, and we are going to dump all of our vegetables into here, and it's not gonna be messy, and we're not gonna spill at all. Okay, so that is right around 700 grams. Now we're gonna take relatively cool tap water if you live in a place with chlorinated water you might want to let the water sit overnight to let the chlorine evaporate out because it can mess with the fermentation but i've never had a problem with it dump our water in there we're gonna add a little more i want to fill the jar most of the way because we don't really want to have too much headspace. It is gonna bubble up when it ferments, so we don't want it right up to the top, um, but I like to fill it within about an inch, inch and a half, so there's not too much oxygen in there. Okay, so we've got about 1.6 kilos in total. We're gonna to do 4% of that weight in salt. So, gonna pull out our trusty calculator that's in our pocket that our teacher told us we'd never have handy in our pocket. And we're gonna take 1600, multiply that by 0.04, 64 grams of salt. I'm gonna use my uh, small scale here. We're gonna zero that guy out. And then we're just gonna measure 64 grams of kosher salt. I don't think it really matters what kind of salt you use. I just always have kosher salt in the house, so I'm gonna use this. These big grains are good. I'm gonna drop that in there. And then we're gonna very carefully strain out our water. this incredible kitchen gadget here. And then we're just gonna stir it. We're just gonna whisk it. We're not using hot water because we don't want to kill off the bacteria. So we're just gonna whisk until that salt's mostly dissolved. When a problem comes along, you must whisk it. Okay, we're gonna just pour our dissolved salt water into the jar. Ooh. 
Totally forgot an important step. We need our mix-ins, we want our flavoring. So because this is an Italian American thing, we're gonna mix in some oregano. Give it that classic Italian flavor. And I'm not worried about chopping it up too much because this is gonna get chopped after it ferments when we go to serve it. We're gonna throw in a little yellow mustard seed, and a little black mustard seed, some peppercorns. The peppercorns, after they soak in the brine for a while, get really nice and soft, so they'll chop into the jardinera pretty nicely. And then we want some spice. So we're gonna take one of these nice, fresh cayenne peppers that I grew this summer, and we're just gonna slice this guy up pretty small because we do want it to disperse, you know? We don't want big chunks of pepper. Should probably be wearing gloves, but you know, I like, I like living on the edge. Is that enough pepper? You sure? Fresh, Yeah. So. See how hot these are. There's not many seeds in them. Oh yeah, that's enough pepper, holy sh... Wow! Oh, okay. <laughs> Good call, Sky. Ah. Wow! I'm not like a wimp when it comes to spice. I eat a lot of really spicy food. God damn. We're gonna need to take a break. This is... Oh, my mouth's on fire. I feel like I'm on hot ones. Oh my god. <laughs> there weren't even seeds in that. Oh my god. Okay, so our jardinier is ready to go. We have our salt brine, we have our flavorings, we have our vegetables. Um, it is, everything's kind of floating up top right now. So what you can do is you can pop a fermentation weight on there to, oh my God. <laughs> is you can pop a fermentation, like glass weight on there um, just to keep everything down. You can take a plastic bag and put some beans in there and let that sit on top. A little bit of air contact, technically you're supposed to avoid. I don't sweat too hard about it. As long as you don't have a headspace, it's not a big deal. You might get a li little bit of white film developing on top if you're doing a longer ferment or if you have a lower salt concentration. Um, that can be a type of mold. It can also be yeast. It's actually not a big deal. You can just scoop it off and if there's anything that's floating on top, just chuck that. Um, but it's not that big a deal. Just watch out for like big clumps of fuzzy mold or like black or blue mold. If you see that, just throw it away. You don't want to take chances with that. But a little bit of the white stuff, not a big deal. This is gonna take a week or two to finish. Um, what's gonna happen is those, those bacteria are gonna start waking up and, and they're gonna to come to life and they're gonna start fermenting this and they're gonna take anywhere between a week and two weeks. So I would store it just in a, you know, in a corner of your kitchen out of the way that's um, out of the sunlight uh, and, and maybe put it in a dish, like an oven dish, because it will get very active. I'll show you in a sec, I'll open one that's been going for a week. Um, these ferments can get very active when you open them. They can. They can eject uh, a lot, especially if it's a thick ferment like kimchi, it can get real messy. So uh, keep it in a dish or if you're gonna open it, um, open it in the sink. Speaking of opening it, um, if you don't have like a special airlock on these, you want to do what's called burping. So once or twice a day, if your ferment's very active, uh, you're just gonna carefully put your hand on top, unlatch it, and then gently let some of that CO2 that's been developing escape. Um, and it, it's probably gonna fizz up, which is why you wanna do it in the sink. Um, but that's just gonna keep the pressure from building up inside the jar, which you know you wanna avoid. Um, and, and as that starts to slow down, that's when your ferments uh, getting to the area where it's probably gonna be done soon. Um, and you can, you can throw it in the fridge before it's done fermenting, or you can let it go longer and get funkier. It's totally up to you, just experiment, have fun, try fermenting different stuff. Um, and yeah, most of all, just mess around, enjoy it. With both pickling and fermenting, make sure that you label everything. Um, and then once your ferment's done, just pop it in the fridge. It'll keep for months or even a couple years in the fridge. Let's look at one that I started a week ago. This guy is very active and very full of pressure. You can see all the, I did have a weight in there, but all the tomatoes have kind of been forced to the top. I've wanted to try lacto-fermented tomatoes for uh, a few years and I just haven't got around to it. I'm kind of skeptical. Tomatoes are pretty soft, so it might get kind of mushy and funky. This is a really low concentration, just a 2% brine, but you can see like all that action in there. This ferment is like at its peak of activity right now. It's probably gonna start slowing down in a day or two, but let's, let's open this guy up and see what happens.
All right, so it smells tomatoey, big shock, kind of yeasty. I'm just gonna push everything back down into there. Yeah, look at all, look at those bubbles, wow. Yeah, so this is a low, low percentage of salt. It's 2% salt by weight, um, and I didn't add any water in this chase. So it's, it's pretty wild. We're really letting those yeast go nuts. Um, our jardinera probably won't get that active, but I do find like when I make kimchi, for example, it, it does like to get this active. Um, this ferment isn't done, but if you get it to a point where you like, you know, get a ferment to a point where you like it, you can, uh, you can stop it at any point. You throw it in the fridge, slow those bacteria down and, and call it quits. So we're going to put, put some out into our beautiful plate from our friends at Spirit Wares here. And just try a little bit of this. Try a little bit of the juice first. Ooh, ah, it's bright, it's fresh, it's acidic. It's really good. Um, that would make a delicious Caesar. And that is probably what I'm gonna do with these. Um, these are getting pretty like mushy and kind of nasty. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna eat them as is. You can see like the lactic acid bacteria have totally broken down. All that salt's like destroyed the cell structure of the tomato and it's really starting to fall apart. So I'm probably gonna puree this and then I'll mess around with trying maybe some Caesars, um, maybe use it as like a broth um, or a pizza sauce maybe. It's the, the umami factor has, has gone up too. Um, that lactic ferment often produces uh, more, I don't know if it's a glutamic acid or what it is, but it gives you more intense umaminess. And so a lot of chefs like to use fermentation for that reason. And so this is, is really good anywhere you want a, a serious punch of umami. Mm, yeah, so I might stop this ferment now because if I let it keep going, it's going to get super funky. And I don't mind the extreme funk. Some people love it, but it's it's not totally my jam. Um, I like the stuff that's a little more fresh and acidic. So I, I think I'm gonna stop this now, chuck it in the fridge and make some Caesars this weekend. Before we close out, so the pickling in and, and fermenting are two of the easiest ways that you can preserve food. But there's a number of easy, other easy ways that I'm just gonna kinda run through one by one real quick, just to give you an idea. Um, Cause there's, obviously you, you know, you have limited fridge space, limited shelf space. You maybe don't wanna can everything from your garden. So let's talk about a few different techniques. First up is drying things. Uh, this works especially well for herbs. We've all bought dried herbs from the store. They're usually pretty old and flavorless. Um, dried herbs from your garden tend to turn out a lot better. This is oregano that I dried a week ago. Um, I just have an abundance of oregano in my garden. So what I do is I, I harvest all the herbs that I wanna dry, I stick them on a tray, I turn my oven to the lowest setting, I let it preheat, I throw that tray in the oven, I turn the oven off right away and I just let it sit overnight. That gets, that kickstarts the drying process and gets a lot of moisture out. Um, and then I just let it sit on my counter for a few days. And, and in a few days it's like this. And at this point you can then just very easily strip everything off the stems and put all of that into a jar and then you have you know dried oregano and if you've been successful with your garden or you buy a lot of herbs from the store you can have dried herbs all throughout the winter um, they're, they're quite lovely um, you can dry other things too if you have a lot of chard or kale you can dry that and then powder it and add that powder to smoothies or soups just as like a boost of iron and and you know greenery um, i made sun dried tomatoes last year I, I didn't feel like canning a lot and so i cut the majority of my tomatoes in half i you can air dry them. If you have hot weather, it's, it works better. Um, I did them in a dehydrator and you, you can get those pretty cheap on Kijiji. But I dried them out till they were leathery, not like super dry, but still kind of leathery. And then I just packed them in oil with some oregano and some chili flake. And they were, they were phenomenal. I, I, they lasted me until May or June. And uh, we're just like a nice burst of, of like sunshine in really cold, dark months when, you know, things are kind of depressing. It's, it's nice to have that freshness. So I would definitely try drying stuff like that. Um, speaking of oil, uh, something like a jardinera, you can pickle or ferment um, and then you can strain it and pack it in oil and keep it in your fridge. It's a very traditional Italian method. Um, I'll do that with eggplant, chop the eggplant into big batons, salt it, suck all the water out, squeeze it, pickle it, squeeze the brine out, then pack it in oil in the fridge with oregano and chili flakes and it's, it's phenomenal on sandwiches. Uh, another method that I really like is making syrups. Uh, it's something that's good if you have an overabundance of certain herbs. Uh, say mint, for example, you can make a mint syrup, um, one part by weight, sugar and water, 
throw whatever you want to infuse into the syrup. Um, and it's delicious for making cocktails, for making non-alcohol sodas, uh, if you have a soda stream. Um, and you can, you can get pretty crazy. You can also use up a lot of scraps. So just like orange or lemon peel, if you're not going to use them, uh, make a syrup out of them. You can also uh, save seeds. A lot of plants have edible seeds with flavor, like uh, onion plants, for example. These are from lovage plants, lovage seeds. So they have like a really intense kind of celery flavor. Um, so that is just a good way to add, you know, save things, get more out of your plants that can bring more flavor. Or of course you can just plant those seeds. Um, and then lastly, my favorite way, I think, to preserve things. This is uh, my 2023 projects. So I like to make liqueurs. And, and related things. So I'll take different things from my garden and then soak them in booze and make, make really good things. So um, I've got, this is a Saskatoon berry liqueur here. People know those are service berries as well. This is a Haskett berry liqueur. Both of these been going for a couple months. This is something I started doing last year. It's uh, rhubarb infused into rum. It's really delicious. So I'll add some sugar to all of these once I strain them and they're, they're done preserving. Um, this is, I actually spilled most of this, but this was a uh, spruce tip. So just an interesting flavor that I wanted to try to capture. Uh, another success from last year was like a dandelion Amaro. Uh, it's an Italian thing. And so I wanted to make it with dandelions. And then uh, this is my newest experiment, which is a anise based um, liqueur. Oh my God, it smells like absinthe. You can get really creative, as you can see with the pres preservation. You can go deep down the rabbit hole or you can just keep it simple and, and make some pickles every now and then. Um, if you have a pre favorite preservation method or you have questions about what we, what we talked about today, pop them in the comments below. Um, you know, you don't need a lot of fancy gear, a lot of money to do it. So it's, it's very accessible uh, and you get to be part of this like ancient art of preservation. If you want to do more learning, you can also pick up the Noma Guide to Fermentation. This book gets real sciencey and nerdy and pretty artistic. So there's a lot of cool stuff going on in here. That's it. Yeah, it's on. How's that for test audio? <laughs> Shout out to Prometheus, my my number one demigod. <laughs> Fucking legend. Ah, oh God, oh no! This is beats.